Welcome everyone. Today we are talking about product roadmaps. What is a product roadmap? How does it guide your business and how do, do you develop one? We're so pleased to be joined by Bob Egner, the CMO and Vice President of Product Management at Outpost24. Hi, Bob. Hi. Outpost24 is a leading cyber assessment company with over 2,000 customers in more than 40 countries. And Bob has led marketing and product management and business development functions for both large and small security and e-business companies in all regions of the world. And he is a real product roadmap guru. So great that you can join us. Thanks, happy to be here. And I am also joined in the studio um, by Per Ivanson from Montero. And he has over 20 years of experience in the software industry as a senior executive. And Per is an expert from the technical perspective on how to develop products based on a roadmap. You're such a great team. Um, to both of you, how many of the Montero companies have you worked with? Well, it's been several over the years. If I count some of the pre-Montero companies where Peter Larson and Thomas Bill and Gustav Lagerkrantz have worked, it's probably four altogether. And you also joined, worked together, um, Per, at uh, EpiServer. Any war stories you want to share from that period? Yeah, what? that's right. Uh, per and I have uh, some history together. I think normally between the product team and the development team, there's always uh, what you might call a healthy tension of trying to figure out the best way forward. But we worked through that and had a very successful company. Do you agree, Per? <laughs> Absolutely. Healthy friction between product management and development <laughs> is always good to sort of right. balance, balance the roadmap a bit. So as you can hear, we have all the expertise we need in the studio to really give you an overview of um, how to work with the product roadmap. So let's just dive right in. Uh, Bob, how can you use a product roadmap to drive your business forward? Well, one of the things I find when I'm working with uh, newer companies uh, or maybe uh, just growing up the experience curve is there's a misunderstanding of product roadmap. Uh, I think a lot of people have this tendency to think of the roadmap as a game plan for how to direct internal work. While there's some element of that that works, that's actually not the purpose of the roadmap at all. The real purpose of the roadmap is a way to communicate your product strategy and the value you can deliver to customers. It's a visual uh, type of tool. Of course, you can derive the work that needs to be done internally from it, but the roadmap is not what you just hand over to development and say, please build this. It's much more of a vision document. And we'll also go into detail of what it should contain and um, how it should be designed to um, really engage all constituents. Right. Uh, per, you have a long experience from executing on a product roadmap. Can you tell us how it can guide the development team? I would say the product roadmap should be the map for the development team. So, I mean, in the, in the best of worlds, I mean, at every given point in time, a developer should work on something that is derived from that roadmap. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's not always the case, but if they are not doing that, you should at least uh, challenge that and question why. Bob, how does a roadmap tie or relate to your company vision and, and business strategy? Well, from my view, the product roadmap is really the central element of how you talk about product vision. It's the way that you think about the problem area that the customer has that they want to solve. That's essentially why they're going to pay you some money after all with the product. So you want to make sure that's clear. And you also want to consider how that product is differentiated or uh, better than other competitive offers that might be on the market or any alternate solutions that the customer might have to solve that same problem. So when you put all of that into the roadmap, it gives you this idea that you can communicate to the customers what problems they're solving, why they should spend some money with you. It also gives an idea to the rest of the organization how they should be thinking about their work when it's development side, thinking about ways that they might want to innovate or extend even further from the product concepts and the problems that you're solving for customers. Uh, but it has to be balanced against, for example, technical backlog is one of these things that 
uh, CTOs are always telling me about. There's these problems with things that have been built uh, that they need to improve and do better. Those are great things that need to be addressed by the development team, but if they don't add value to the customer, there's not really a place to talk about it on the roadmap or in the product vision. Is there like a format? What should um, what should the uh, product product um, roadmap map look like? Is there is it a document? Well, my favorite uh, tool to use to create a roadmap is PowerPoint. After all, it's a communication tool, and PowerPoint is a great way to help you communicate what the vision is. But most frequently, the roadmap itself, if you think of it as like a single slide, it's got some information on it, which is important, and that's sometimes the takeaway information, but the more important thing is the voiceover that goes with it. What's the narrative and the story about the problem that you're solving for the customer, why you're doing in that, that in a better or more efficient way than other options they may have. Now, keeping in mind, if that's what you're communicating out of the roadmap, then you can derive from that a set of actions that the development team needs to take, but you can derive other things that are really useful for the business as well. For example, marketing messages can be derived from the roadmap or sales enablement material, ways to help the sales team, whether you're selling directly or through a channel, understand how to talk about the problems and the challenges the customers will have, how they can solve those with the product that you're building, and consider what other elements or components need to be in place in the customer's environment for them to get value out of the, the product that you're providing to them. So all of these different areas provide guidance for the executive leadership of the company, for the CEO to be able to uh, better direct the company to the end goal, which is grow more customers, provide more value, and the company ends up growing in size as a result. Where should the input come from, Bob? Well, a lot of different places, actually. Sometimes people think, oh, I should be very customer driven and just go out and do some interviews and get the answers back from them. But uh, Per and I have talked a few times in the past about this idea that, you know, if Henry Ford, when he was inventing a car, would have just gone to customers and asked, they would have asked for a faster horse, which is not exactly what we're trying to do here. We're trying to understand the customer's problem, but build something that's a new or innovative way to solve that problem. So customer input is great to understand some context, to understand the nuances of how the customer views that as valuable, but there's other places to look as well. So we typically uh, on product management teams will look at competitive landscape, what are other solutions doing? We'll look at technology trends, how the landscape is changing for the customer and where we might need to be at some point in the near or further out future. And it's also good to get some validation from industry analysts or from technology partners. There's really a lot of different places that you can go to get input and try to determine what goes on the roadmap. But again, the key thing is to try to set that vision forward and then lay out a sequence of steps that are very achievable that gives value to the customer at every step along the way. So don't ask customers um, what they want or don't ask developers, Pat, what we should develop <laughs> next is what I hear you I say. Ju I just want to say something about uh, uh, the roadmap here that in, Bob might have a different opinion, but in my world, there should be one roadmap that is communicated externally and also internally. And it has to be sort of as inspiring internally and developers are mostly very down to earth looking at the roadmap is this realistic or is it not and sometimes there's a tendency you put more things in there than you will actually build which is in, in my view quite demoralizing or not uh, believable for an organization and then it's it, it's uh, yeah it should be one document but it sh you should be able to present it internally externally so I, if I hear you correctly, it should be only one document. Yes, I think so, because otherwise everyone will know that there is another document out there that is shown to customers promising everything that we know that we will never going to build. Do you agree, Bob? Two versions yeah, is not uh, really credible and not motivating. Right, it's a good point, and I think we uh, need to make sure as leaders that everyone in the organization understands the purpose of the roadmap, the customer communication, and the sort of message that will go out. So sharing it internally is a really great step, not just to the development team, but to everybody else who works in the company. So they understand the direction we're going and they can kind of 
align their actions towards that same end result. The idea of uh, being realistic in the roadmap is, I think, also a very important one so that the organization sees that goal that you're trying to reach and they can see themselves kind of working to get there. But in some cases, you have items on the roadmap that you may not even solve with uh, internal development. Maybe there's an acquisition that needs to be done to bring a piece of technology in, or maybe it's a technology partnership that needs to be put in place. And those things are fair to put on the roadmap as well, because again, if you're communicating to customer, you want them to understand if they need to have multiple vendors providing components, for example, mm -hmm. that they've got a complete view of what they're getting into if they decide to move forward with your company. When I'm listening to you, I'm hearing much more of a communication um, document, um, something that should spark engagement rather than just uh, lay out a, a set of, of steps going forward, uh, an engaging PowerPoint or a video um, almost sounds like it should be it has entertainment value. Bob. Yeah, I sim sometimes see I mean, that people are confusing a roadmap, which for me is a visionary thing that is sort of this is the company vision. And, and, and confuse it with a backlog, with a stuff of things that should be done in a certain time frame. Uh, so that's a very big difference. I mean, the roadmap is what you show and what you sell the company on. And the backlog is something that has to back that up. But that's an internal document only. Great. Great. Right. It's a good point, Per. It's the difference between a project plan and the product vision. So the project plan, the work that needs to be done is probably not so entertaining to the customer, but when you're communicating where you're going with the company, it needs to be inspiring, uh, engaging, something that people want to listen to it, or they hear what your thoughts are about how the world will be in the future when your product is done, and they can see themselves in that point in time as well. They can see that kind of value that comes to the customer. So it's a, like any sort of public speaking uh, situation. You want to be engaging and a bit entertaining in the process. Um, as a leader of a software company, how should I quality assure my uh, product roadmap? How do I know if it's, it's good, uh, if it sparks engagements and shows the way forward, Bob? Yeah, this is, I think, another area where some uh, younger companies I've seen uh, have a little bit of challenge in this area because they're sort of thinking the mindset of this is a set of instructions, this is a project plan of things that we need to build. But if you think about it from that standpoint of this is a product vision that's going to guide a lot of what the company's doing, a, a CEO has the ability to look at the roadmap and sort of raise questions about it. Uh, is it realistic? Is it something we can achieve for what the CEO knows? Is it something the customers that they've spoken to will be interested in purchasing? How would this product look from a, a pricing standpoint based on the value that it gives to the customer? So uh, having an executive engagement with the roadmap and trying to poke holes in it, trying to find places where there's weakness uh, is actually a, a good step to take. And it does have this effect of helping companies grow because it raises the CEO up to this point of being able to ask questions or provide further guidance and insight about the roadmap instead of being the guy who invents the roadmap or tells the story or has a problem with changing the story from time to time, which uh, unfortunately happens for some smaller companies as well. But I think a roadmap also doesn't just tell a, a development department on what they should build. It's, it's a sort of a map for the whole company. It's what, okay, this is going to be market where in what regions, new markets, how will support we need to change when this feature comes out that will be supported 27 in, in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a set, it's a map for the whole company where all departments are in, involved in, in one or another way. Should it be public? I think so. Yeah. There's no reason yeah. why. Mm -hmm. I agree as well. It's like you wouldn't want to hold back on your message about how you're trying to change the world. So, of course, it needs to be public. The details uh, of what exactly you're going to do, you probably don't share quite as many of those. And the timing is the one area that some people get concerned with is, well, if I put the roadmap out and it shows I'll have a certain capability at some time in the future, what if we change our minds? Well, do you always put the fine print on the roadmap that says, 
this is our plan. These things may change based on market conditions so that there's an awareness that it's the general direction you're going as opposed to the specific things that will be delivered at a certain point in time. And, and to be honest, if you, if you look at what customer needs at a certain point in time in a project, for example, that's not something that would be in a typically in a roadmap. That's often a feature or a, something else that, it, that would be more of a backlog internal document. Tell us more um, about how the roadmap um, converts into a, a steering document uh, for planning. How, how is it broken down into user stories and tasks, do you think, Per? Most cases I've seen, and I think that's pretty standard today, that you have the roadmap, which is the product vision that is owned by product management, basically. Uh, you take that vision and you break it down to something called epics, which are larger projects that you can basically monetize from. It could be modules, new products, whatever. Big stories or big epics. Uh, I would say that is also broken down by PMs together with product owners, I would say. And from that, you take it down to user stories, which are used by developers who will bring those down in something called tasks, which are smaller pieces that typically one, two day work, mm -hmm. while the user story is typically two week. And again, how does it tie to the backlog? Uh, the backlog, I would say, is the user stories are collected in a backlog and prioritized. But that's how they are prioritized is, is more of a technical issue. What, what things should we build first? What do we need to have in place to build that thing? But all should uh, come up to the actual epic because the epic is where you have an MVP that you can actually go out and, and, and sell. And, and Just because I have you here in the studio, any tips when managing a backlog? Tips when managing a backlog? Uh, I would say, I mean, a, a backlog is managed by someone that is have the technical skills to know in which order things are supposed to come but it can also be a, a joint work with a product owner or product manager as well because today you usually don't build a whole product and then you ship it when it's done you build something some mvp minimum viable product you stick it out there uh, see what people think about it, and then you add feature by feature on top of it. And those feature in the order, the feature will come after the MVP. I would say that's still a lot of uh, product management uh, decisions in the prioritization of those. Bob, in what other ways can you use um, your product ma uh, roadmap in your daily business? In what other um, types of um, cases is it valuable? Right. So this is one of the things that you mentioned about my background. I end up having this responsibility that usually spans between a marketing function and a product management function. And it's, I would say, a little bit unusual for someone who's in a marketing role to have a, a bit of technical background. Uh, and that's the type of thing that uh, I think is important to consider here. It's a communication tool, the roadmap. And so what it's telling you, the narrative or the voiceover that goes with it, is telling you about the messaging that you should use from a marketing standpoint. So from my perspective, product messaging, company messaging, value-based messaging uh, to get customers interested in what you're doing comes directly out of that product vision that you have in the roadmap. Uh, you can also take it from there and think about what the customer needs to do to implement that product and start to build content that would be deeper in the funnel, deeper in the sales cycle, based on the direction that you're going with the product. At the same time, you've got a channel a direct sales team or a, a channel sales team that will be taking this product to market. And so all of the considerations that would be going through the customer's mind can be derived from that same product vision. How would you expect the customer to implement it? What sort of steps would they need to take? And you can bring that forward in sales enablement material as well. So there's a lot of ways that you can use it to help with the front end of the sales cycle, but also when it comes to delivery. So if this is a SaaS based product, you may have a, a dev ops kind of scenario and you want to think about the operational nature of the product and what you're doing with it. All of the customer success, customer facing roles that you might have in place 
to help customers once they purchase a SaaS product needs to tie back to the value because normally SaaS products are built around this kind of land and expand approach where you're going in and solving a first problem today, but you're looking for additions in users, uh, usage or use cases to try to grow your business from there. And so if you know what that product vision is and you can get the customer facing customer success team to be able to incorporate that into their thinking, you also create a bigger opportunity for a cross sell or an upsell of additional products or features or additional usage uh, over time, as long as everyone's really focused around that value to customer. And so I think that's really the, the core, the starting point for the whole thing, the product vision and what the value to the customer is, and then you can expand a lot from there. Do you think customers um, should be involved in the process of creating a, a product roadmap? if you have any? Yeah, of course. Uh, the question is, how should they be involved? So as we talked earlier about, should you just ask customers what to build next? You might be a little surprised at the answers that you get. So you should always take that as an uh, input and factor it in with some other inputs. Uh, I think what is considered best practice, the way that uh, I've operated uh, the product management function at other companies as well as at Outpost 24, is to start a customer advisory board. And the idea is there is to take uh, your top customers, the ones that are really engaged with your product and finding value from it, and get them together on a regular basis. Sometimes it's in person once a year, sometimes it's quarterly engagements by email or web meetings. Uh, but what you're trying to do there is bring in your view of what the roadmap is uh, after you've done your homework internally and throw it on the table and see what kind of response you get. In some cases, they'll validate that, yeah, you're on the right track, but maybe you should change the timing for this or that piece. And in other situations, they're going to bring up new and unfolding problem areas that they have that they don't know what the solution is. And you can take that as input to either decide if you need to shift a little bit and start building in that direction, if there's a potential partnership or acquisition that you would need to make to be able to provide even more value to that customer. Um, Par, is it possible to sort of set priorities in the roadmap? There has to be. Uh, I think setting priorities in, in a roadmap and also in, in a backlog with user stories is probably the most important work uh, for product management and product owners but it's also often the, the, the hardest. I mean, you will, you will find yourself lacking uh, development resources before you lack great ideas. But uh, I think that, that is sort of the essence of a product manager role, how to prioritize these things right. And I guess all the input that Bob just talked about hopefully will guide a product manager to, to do things in the right order with the right resources. That's at least what I would say a development department has to trust in, have the trust in product management that they have prioritized. It's the right things to do and they are prioritized in the right order. They have to trust that that is correct and all the input that the product management got is correct and they have done a fair assessment. Prioritizing means balancing between values or activities what is it that we are balancing here bob uh, i think the a couple of the comments that pair made sort of gets to that point there's different roles in the company as you start to mature and build uh, size in the company and it might start off initially where you've got someone who is doing both a product management function and a product owner function and the idea is that as the company gets bigger that you can kind of split that out and the product manager is really looking at how the business can grow with that particular product how they can gain market share helping more customers at every step along the way that uh, needs to be balanced but as Per was saying the prioritization is about how to make the business move forward so that usually is where the starting point is but the product manager won't know everything about the best way to build the product or implement it. And so that's the, where the collaboration comes with product owners and the development team. And that trust word that Pear was using, I think is a really important one to consider here. It's gotta be uh, re a relationship of peers viewed as equal, viewed as having uh, important inputs where the company decides together which way uh, the company needs to go. 
So it's first and foremost, understanding we're trying to build the business. We're trying to grow the business, add new customers, get more income and revenue coming in. And at the same time, doing that in the right way so that you're constantly adding new value to the customer so that you are uh, building plans that are achievable, that can be accomplished in the timeframes that you set out. I think I think a good example is, uh, for example, if you, if you have in your vision that we are going to make this uh, service as a sauce, this feature or function, it probably has a lot of features and functions in it that product management has decided, but also to to move the company forward and not get stuck with all these upgrades issues, etc. You have to build in automation in deployment of this thing. You will have to be able to monitor this thing internally. That's nothing that the customer will immediately see, but it's something that has to be done from a technical perspective. And that's that's often where this uh, what we say healthy friction occurs between product right. management and development. How much time are you going to spend on, on the technical parts that is not visible or is not sellable to customers? How much should yeah. you? Exactly. It's the, yeah. At the end mm. of the day, it comes down to finding the right balance. Uh, you have performance and scalability considerations, operational cost considerations that could sink the business if there's too much that's uh, too many processes that have not been automated. But at the same time, you have to have the right sort of features that are attractive and interesting to customers to want to buy it. And that's where it's really a, it becomes a leadership question or the direction that the company's going and the CEO needs to be involved in helping mitigate some of those potential missteps. How do you how do you update your product roadmap and how often should you do that? Well, uh, the typical process that I follow is one where we're trying to do quarterly updates, mm. uh, at least looking at the progress we're making from a development standpoint and changes in the market conditions on a quarterly basis. So every three months or so seems like that has the right feel to it. However, we might just be reviewing and validating that what we have is correct, or we might be putting in a few additional details about some changes or adjustments we're making along the way. But sort of the major overhaul is something that you hold off for uh, less frequent updates. Uh, maybe that's something that you look at on an annual basis, maybe part of a business planning process. Again, it's validating that you're on the right path. So what was in the roadmap previously is still good. Uh, pull things out that don't make sense anymore or that you know you're never going to get to or you tried in the market and no one was really interested in it. It's OK to take things away after you've done some experimentation. Uh, and then add in the things that are trends and evolution that's happening in the market or maybe new competitive forces that are coming to play that you need to consider so that you can keep moving forward on that growth trajectory. I don't, I don't know how your roadmaps looks today, but I remember those uh, at episode that you usually have sort of a, a short term, mid term, long term kind of approach with, with items in it where the short term might be. I mean, it's things that we are doing, working on, basically. Uh, zero to right. six months and then you have the long term which is like six to i don't know 24 months and then you have the long term which is a little bit more vague where usually the word ai shows up <laughs> <laughs> with no right. further explanation <laughs> yeah exactly but that again is that's how you're communicating to your customers how you're moving the company forward so if you take those three buckets it's like now next and later uh, the, the time frames can be a little bit variable, but the point is what I'm working on now is things the customers can expect to come out fairly soon. The things that are next are what we have queued up to follow. And that fine print I mentioned earlier, like, you know, things may change based on business conditions uh, is to imply that there's no commitment to timing in what we're showing in the roadmap. So we may adjust based on some sudden change in market conditions or some very large customer interest uh, that has a big contract behind it where you wanna shift something that's in the next bucket and pull it into the now bucket so that you're working on it maybe sooner than what you thought. The one that becomes difficult uh, and this discussion we had earlier about sort of demoralizing to a development team is if you take one of those far off in the future things like AI that Pear mentioned and say, oh, we have to do that right now. That's really hard to do. 
And so you need to be very careful about situations where you bring that forward. I would say, and from my experience, a lot of times those discussions come up when you've got a very enthusiastic sales character who's coming in saying there's this giant deal that we can get if only we have this capability now. The sales qualification process hopefully will vet those things and get them off the table. But if they come into discussion, you need to have some serious consideration around what's really achievable in that time frame and what do you give up if you take other parts of the roadmap away and pull some future areas into the now area. And that's when you go to your roadmap and it helps you back up your arguments. Exactly, mm -hmm. yes, because you've got the company buy-in to it, you've got executive support for it, you've put something together that people agree with the, the right components to build. The timing might be a little uncertain, but that gives you some flexibility to adapt uh, with the business conditions. I think you gave us so much input. It's been um, it's been very straightforward and very practical as well. So I hope everybody watching and listening uh, that you feel that you can really use this um, and that you can also start experimenting with developing a product product roadmap pair. Finally, we, I always ask um, the Montero uh, representative in the in the pod to help me or help the uh, listeners and viewers to summarize three key takeaways around product roadmaps, yeah, what would they be? Three short key takeaways. I think uh, the first one is that the roadmap should be able to sell the vision of the company externally as well as internally. It's not an internal document with, with items on it that should be just done. It, it's a vision, it has to be uh, nice to look at, it has to inspire, etc., etc. I think that that's the key takeaway from uh, the roadmap format. And what we have touched upon that it should contain things that are realistic to actually deliver so the organization can buy in on this and think that yes, we can achieve these goals that we have with our company and not just feel, Jesus, so many things, we will never be able to achieve this. Uh, and the last thing, and it's pretty technical, but from, from a development standpoint, uh, if you can set up your, your support system and you be very disciplined when you're creating these epics, user stories, tasks, etc., so you can actually, from a system perspective, track a task that a developer has at hand up through the chain all the way up to the roadmap. Because every time someone is working on something else that isn't traceable back to roadmap, you, th you should question that. I'm not saying that things are always will come in from the side, absolutely so, but you should be aware of that right now that developer is not working on the, on the company vision. And then you have a com common language, you have a common vision, and you have a common document to unite around. So thanks for showing us both uh, how it is crafted and also um, how it can be used for, for steering forward um, for developing customer value. It's been so great to have you from Chicago, uh, Bob Igner. Thank you so much from join, for joining and also um, Per Ivanson um, in the studio here in Stockholm. And thanks everyone for listening and tune in to the next episode where we continue giving you uh, valuable advice for how to build and grow your software company. See you then.